I thought the overreaction was absurd. A lot of different things were happening at different vantage points at different times on January 6th. But I would say overall, the government and the people who were in charge are ultimately responsible for what happened. Howdy, I'm Hannah Neuenschwander, a production lead at a soybean seed facility in central Illinois, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, we sit down with my longtime friend, Julie Kelly. Longtime listeners of the podcast might remember when I had Julie on during the COVID epidemic, and I got more hate from that podcast than anything else I have ever put out. After having Julie on, people talked about how could I platform this person, um, that I was a eugenicist, that uh, many of the things that she was saying were totally off the rails. But if you go back and listen to what she was talking about during COVID, I dare say she was even more prescient than Alex Jones on a lot of things. She knew about what states should be doing to stand up for themselves, pushing back on a lot of regulation. It is a fascinating interview. And I can say that one of the reasons that it is difficult to have Julie Kelly on is because I'm afraid that she is definitely on lists. She is g- probably going to be audited by the IRS. Um, somebody from the FBI will probably knock on her door one day unexpectedly and lead her away to ask her some questions. And I mean that seriously. I think Julie really pushes the envelope, and I think we are in for a very interesting conversation. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about an experience with legacy interviews that recently happened. A woman called me up that said her friend's father had just been given a diagnosis of cancer, and he only um, he was trying to get all of his things in order and wanted to know if we could do a legacy interview remotely. We uh, ended up talking to the family. We set something up, and we've now done three different sessions with that family in order to be able to capture his memories the things that he wanted to be recorded about his land and the ranch that he's run. And he wanted to talk about what he thinks his grandchildren can accomplish. And I think that his legacy interview is a powerful testament to how important it is to pass stories down so that future generations know where they came from and what is possible for them to do in this life. So if you're interested in having me record a legacy interview either in our St. Louis studios or if it's best to be done online, go to LegacyInterviews.com to find out more. All right, without further ado, let's have Julie Kelly on. Julie Kelly, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Vance. I, I think I was trying to remember the last time that we did talk, and I think it was during the early stages of COVID. Oh, yeah, it so was during the lockdowns. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, you were talking all about That's how, right. like, uh, because at the time, there were, there were Florida was talking about blocking their state from people coming in, and then you were down there, and there weren't mass mandates. Mm-hmm. And I remember you were sitting um, outside, and there was, like, an open air, and you're like, people are moving around in Florida unlike other parts of the country. And it was something that people had just not seen online. The regular news was not portraying this. And I think that that's actually where you really fit is where the news is not talking about uh, what's going on in the world. And uh, one of the most important stories that you've been shedding light on is the uh, Michigan Governor Whitmer uh, kidnapping plot started by the FBI. So to start off, maybe if uh, somebody had not heard at all about this, how would you even explain this crazy situation? Right. So this sort of has percolated as an issue, at least in the Republican presidential primary, because as you know, Vivek Ramaswamy has brought this up and he brought it up to a CNN reporter uh, who really fought back on the idea that it was an FBI entrapment scheme. Well, of course, we know now Um, And especially in light of what the FBI is capable of, and you and I will talk about that, I'm sure, especially related to January 6th, is that what the FBI did is concoct a kidnapping assassination scheme for Gretchen Whitmer and the governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, who Donald Trump at the time after lockdowns like April, May of 2020 was starting to say, you might recall, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia, Um, And so the FBI put this together, stitched this group of men together who had protested at the Capitol, who were online talking about Whitmer's really severe ongoing lockdown policies. And the FBI ran at least a dozen informants, known as confidential human sources, into this group, lured these men into this trap. 
set up various events, um, field training exercises, a militia conference, if you can believe it or not, that some of them attended in June of 2020. Uh, one man had already been on the FBI's radar screen since 2019. So they stitched this random group together using 12, at least 12 undercover, or excuse me, 12 informants, at least three undercover agents, numerous supervising agents out of multiple field offices. This was known as a terror enterprise investigation. But Vance, it was none, nothing like it. It was one of the most extensive, expansive FBI entrapment operations in decades, which resulted in the arrest of 14 men, six who faced federal charges, the rest who faced state charges. And we could talk a little about the outcome of those trials, but I followed this extensively. I have a relatively new piece up on Real Clear Investigations where I write that sort of details, well, not details, it could be a 20,000, it could be a book and it should be a book, but at least we'll give people sort of an overview of what that FBI entrapment operation looked like. Yeah, it's so crazy to think about that um, your own government could send people out and and not just be like, hey, we're going to have these people show up at these gun shows or we're going to show up at these public meetings and kind of watch mm -hmm. what's going on. But according to your article, which I would recommend everyone go read, it is so expansive. I really had no idea how much detail there was to know about this, but they actually were saying hey, come on, guys, I got an idea. Maybe we could go do this thing with, with the governor. Hey, maybe we should get training for this. And like they definitely took people that were, you know, I, I think um, uh, disenfranchised with their government or that were definitely saying like, hey, something's got to change and pushed them down the path of doing something that that way they could get arrested for it. That is exactly what they did. Not only did they exploit anger about Michigan's lockdown, they also exploited anger about the George Floyd riots. So this militia conference that one of the lead FBI informants organized, a longtime felon, by the way, including convictions for um, sex with minors. I mean, a lot of these informants are really degenerates that our government should not be using in any capacity, let alone paying them cash to do this sort of thing. He organized a militia conference the weekend after the Floyd riots started. And this was outside of Columbus, Ohio, where, as you probably recall, there were a lot of protests and rioting in that city. So not only were they exploiting the anger about the lockdowns and then George Floyd, but Vance, these informants were paying to get these guys stoned, taking them to get them drunk. The informants were also getting drunk with their targets, which is violates FBI. Pro I mean, they violated basically every FBI protocol that there is for informants because there's no there's no accountability to this informant program. Forty five million dollars a year. Our government pays in cash only to uh, informants across the country, really across the world. But this is what they're doing. But the reason why, Vance, is because the FBI wanted to use this to denigrate Donald Trump before the election. The arrests were announced in October of 2020. Another example of the FBI, just like Russiagate, getting involved in a presidential election against Donald Trump. You had Gretchen Whitmer go on this victim, you know, cable news circuit, writing editorials about how Donald Trump is trying to instigate domestic terrorists to take out his political rivals. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris talked about it on the campaign trail especially in Michigan, a key swing state. This was all orchestrated and the timing executed by the FBI to make this really a key campaign issue the last month before Election Day. So who knows how many votes were swayed, especially in Michigan, because this was such a big story there. And now as the trials commenced, and this is really the most important part, you had state and federal trials. Half the men who went on trial were acquitted found not guilty amid this FBI entrapment scheme. Two men were convicted after a second trial, which I talk about in my article and other reports, a second trial in Michigan where the judge really did everything he possibly could to help the DOJ get those convictions after a second trial. So this is a huge defeat for the government. And the reason why is because these jurors saw right through this FBI entrapment scheme the two men convicted at the federal level, now that's on appeal. Uh, those appellate briefs have been filed on both sides. 
And uh, the government and the defendants have asked for oral arguments. So I'm hoping that that will, you know, take place sometime perhaps this summer in Michigan. Now, it's also important, a New York judge just released the fourth member of what they called the Newberg Four. And these were men entrapped by uh, another informant to make it look like Muslims wanted to blow up Jewish community centers in an Air Force base. Um, and this was all to help promulgate, you know, fuel for the first war on terror. These men were arrested in 2009. And this judge blasted the FBI. So these men had no capability. They were targeted by the FBI. They were lured into this plot by this longtime FBI informant. They, they never would have done any of this without the help of the FBI. Now, four of those men finally released on appeal amid another example of FBI entrapment. What else is our FBI doing, aside from setting up entrapment schemes to advance political agendas, uh, which we know that FBI Director Christopher Wray certainly has? Well, it's like really, truly scary uh, to think of the FBI as... Um, becoming so self-righteous, believing that like whatever political agenda they're supporting would allow them to do these things that <clears throat> would would radically alter a person's life. Just the accusation alone of being involved in domestic terrorism would be horrible. But then to actually send people to prison, like it it, it boggles the mind. So of the Whitmer people that have have been convicted, what's the status with them? Are they in prison right now? So you had 14 men arrested, six faced federal charges. Of the six, two men pleaded guilty, including one right before trial started. Of course, that's what the DOJ does. They pressure individuals, threaten to add more charges. You're going to spend a lot more time in jail if you don't plead. So six men, two of them pleaded guilty, testified for the government. That did not go well for the government. Um, two of the men, uh, so four men faced trial in March and April of 2022. After four days of deliberation, the jury in southern West, southwestern Michigan came back, fully acquitted two of the men on all charges. The other two men, Adam Fox and Barry Croft Jr., had a hung jury, so one holdout juror, were told. The government immediately came back, said they were going to retry those two individuals, which they did in August of 2022. As I said, the judge realizing what happened in the first trial, making sure that the jury would be prevented from hearing more information about the FBI's involvement, um, really put, I call his whole body, not a sum on the scale. That resulted in the convictions. Those two men, Vance, were then sentenced to 19 and 22 years in prison. They are both in super max prisons with legitimate terrorists, some of the worst criminals in the country. These two men are now in supermax prisons, cut off from their family, and now they're appeal um, criminal uh, appeal um, attorneys. And so that is the punishment these two men have for daring to go to trial. Had they not gone to trial, and we could talk about this in January 6th too, had all these men pleaded out, we never would have known about this FBI entrapment operation. So DOJ is punishing those men. Then you go to the other eight individuals. Well, wait, wait. You who, said something really ahead. interesting. You said that when they use the um, people that pled um, on the stand, it, it didn't go well. What happened there? Right. So you had two of them who took the stand. And under cross-examination from the defense attorneys, it became very clear, number one, that they were coerced into plea deals. Number two, that they changed their story from what they told the FBI after they were first arrested to now the story that they were telling on the stand, which was they were blaming, at first they had blamed the lead informant, Dan Chappell, for bringing this group together, coming up with a kidnapping plot, driving the targets who had no cars to the surveillance, what they call reconnaissance mission, near Gretchen Whitmer's cottage. Keep in mind, Gretchen Whitmer knew about this for months. Her staff and her, they were in communication with the FBI. They allowed poll cameras to be installed around her property so they could capture evidence as the FBI informants and undercover agents drove these guys to her summer cottage, which was supposed to be the scene of the kidnapping crime. So she knew about it, too. She was never in any danger. 
Um, except that these FBI informants really could have t- taken this to a whole different level if they were dealing with men who really were capable of doing something like this, which they weren't. Anyway, the two men who pleaded had changed their stories. The defense attorneys basically busted them for changing their stories, getting sweetheart you know, sentences in exchange for their testimony. Obviously, the jurors did not believe the two men who then um, were government witnesses. In the second trial, Vance, the, uh, the judge actually limited cross-examination of one of the government witnesses, one of the guys who pleaded guilty. That is now part of the appeal of um, Adam Fox and Barry Croft Jr.'s conviction. So I know it sounds complicated, but I always say, until you understand what the FBI did in the Whitmer fednapping hoax, I call it, you cannot possibly come to terms with what the same department did related to the events of January 6th. So it's just such a useful backgrounder, I think. Well, as I hear this, you know, my, the, the little voice in my head says, okay, Maybe some of those guys weren't guilty, but were there some that were preparing to do this? Do you do you have any sort of sense that some of these guys are not good people, that, that the world is better having locked them away? Well, you know, that's always the argument. And I think it's a very legitimate question. I mean, I've said, you know, some of these guys are not exactly the guys that you would want living next door to you. Um, but they're extremely passionate. They were very passionate against the lockdowns. Um, You know, but by August of 2020, this group was splintering because they really didn't get along. They really thought that Barry Croft Jr., who was the oldest one involved, who had been on the FBI's radar for a while, saying anti-government, anti-authority posts on social media. So they were starting to kind of fall apart. Well, then the FBI runs in more undercover agents, including an alleged explosive expert. And get this, Vance, in September of 2020, the FBI is desperate to keep this plot together. They run this other undercover agent in. He is the explosives expert. He says, I can get you the material. We could build a bomb. We're going to blow up the bridge outside of her cottage so the police can't get there. We're going to kidnap her. We're going to get this, Vance. Put her on a boat in Lake Michigan in October of 2020. These guys didn't even have like a house to live in. I mean, some of them, Adam Fox was homeless living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop in Grand Rapids. They're going to put her on a boat in Lake Michigan in October. That would be a good trick. We're Midwesterners. We know how that's impossible. So this undercover agent shows them a video of an SUV blowing up. So he has legitimacy. The video was made by the FBI. This is the same thing we just saw in the Newberg case as well. They manufacture or fabricate these plots from start to finish, including making videos of blowing blown up Tahoes so they can convince their targets that they're legitimate. It's a crazy I mean, it's story. so crazy. And it's one of those things that as I hear you say this, you think if they're willing to do that, then what else would they be willing to do? As you've done the stuff with the, the Whitmer kidnapping, all the stuff you did around January 6th, are you worried that somebody's going to knock on your door and, and take you away for questioning? <laughs> I mean, I think anyone who is out there vocal against this government, especially Department of Justice, uh, surely is under some sort of surveillance. I'm, I'm quite sure that I am. And all the journalists and other you know influencers on social media who not just cover my work, but ask a lot of other questions, whether it's about COVID and now to your point, what we talked about earlier, all of what we were told at the beginning was a lie. Uh, you know, the whole origins of it, The now Anthony Fauci comes out and says, oh, six feet of social distancing. We never really knew where that came from. Um, you know, masks, vaccines, everything. So anyone who challenges this government, this regime, the Democratic Party, and certainly the administrative state, which really is in control, Uh, you are going to be on a list. So we kind of joke around my house, like what our escape route is if the FBI is not a escape route. But, you know, my my husband's like, okay, we have to protect the dogs. Like, what are we going to do with the dogs? (laughs) So we kind of joke about it. But we know what this FBI and this government, we saw it with social media in 2020. As you know, where the government was in cahoots with big tech to suppress information about the Biden family, uh, to suppress information about, um, you know, possible voting fraud. And so this is 
this is nothing new. And unfortunately, it's accelerated because no one has paid a price for unlawfully, uh, the government unlawfully being in cahoots with especially private interests to suppress free, free speech and political activity. Yeah, and it's wild that the media, the more, I guess more traditional media, maybe we should just say that, that you are the media, um, but the traditional media isn't at every single turn saying, excuse me, um, all right, who was the person that made the six foot designation and told everyone this? Okay, and at what point did you guys find out that they're, that uh, that this was not actually scientifically backed. Okay, and who said this thing about the way masks work? Okay, and why aren't we bringing all of those people up and at a minimum recording how it happened, but more than likely, why aren't they being prosecuted? No one in everyday life gets to make mistakes on that level and not pay a price for it, and yet the media isn't calling anybody to task, and there's no... Uh, you know, report or trial or anything about the people that, that did these really crazy things to American culture. It's so frustrating, Vance. And I think if, you know, especially what happened with COVID and the lockdowns and Anthony Fauci and Deborah Burks and their bogus data, which I think was something you and I talked about initially, these models that were being created based on untested data, um, that no one knew the validity it was coming out of China and then Italy. Well, you know, you've been in the scientific community your entire professional life. You don't just take data like that, plug it into some made up model and then say, oh, we're going to have two million dead of COVID. You don't take what was really an eighth grade paper about the benefits of staying six feet apart during some sort of pandemic and turn that into federal policy that resulted in the destruction, permanent destruction of businesses and other venues. Certainly our children still paying the price for schools being shut down, grade schools, high schools, and certainly universities still paying the price. Now we're seeing the results of that. How far behind American students who were already behind are now so much further behind. And then you have the gall of someone like Randy Weingarten pretending that they never authorized the shutdown of schools? Of course you did. You have all of these experts now who the media, to your point, unflinchingly echoed what they were saying, did no deep dives into the alleged data science that we were told, which was all bogus. Um, and now these same people are backing away. And the real frustration is who is going to pay the price? Anthony Fauci should be in jail. So should Deborah Burks. You talk about a conspiracy to defraud the United States, like a charge that Donald Trump is facing for January 6th. These people, evil people, intentionally lying to the American public who trusted them and resulted in so much catastrophic permanent damage. I have compared it to uh, one of the worst decisions, and I blame Donald Trump for this too, one of the worst decisions outside of declaring war, what happened early in 2020 and the people that we put our trust and really control of the American economy and everything else in, these total liars and frauds and scam artists. Yeah, I mean, control is absolutely right. Like we allowed so much of the local decisions to be made by this like giant federal government that was saying what you could and couldn't do. I mean, and I have this very strong sense that so much of this will get memory hold. I mean, I have specifically saved every single um, podcast I did during COVID, uh, you know, on a separate server to be stored away safely because yeah. like these things happened and it even just two years later, it's hard to remember how it all played out and what did we know and how there were people saying like, no, you can't force me into a mask. Like, no, you can't um, tell me that I'm not allowed to leave my house. And yet the insane numbers of people, like the things that people said to me on Twitter when I would say, I don't want my daughter to only see adults with masks on, I'm not going to do this. I mean, the things that people said to me were some of the grossest, darkest things I'd, I'd ever, you know, they're cheering on the tyranny. And so if we don't have a, a record of us going back and saying, all right, you need to pay a price for your tyranny, then it will happen mm -hmm. again. And I think that that is how a lot of people feel. And I was with you, as you know, 
from day one, I think my first article opposing the initial 15 days to slow the, it was March 19th of 2020. And the title of it was Dangerous Curves. And it was like, this is not how this goes. And I think most shockingly advanced is the scientific community, um, doctors and academia and the scientific world and medical community who embrace this without a single thought of the other human consequences of what would happen to our children letting people die alone without their parent or their spouse there. The inhumanity that was exposed during COVID, I think, and to your point, the comments that you got, the comments that I got, you're a grandma killer, you know, you're evil, you should be, you know, I would wake up and open my Twitter and expect it to be suspended because of what I was writing at the time. I called for Donald Trump to remove Anthony Fauci and Deborah Burks from that White House Coronavirus Task Force in April of 2020. As soon as they called for the extension of the shutdown through March, <clears throat> excuse me, through April, and I said, he needs to remove these individuals. They are dangerous. And so I would wake up and wait to, you know, for the account suspended because as you know, at the time they were deep, platforming people like crazy. And then when I started challenging the masks, especially the vaccines, that too. So thankfully now with Elon Musk in control, we don't have to worry on the right about having our accounts shut down because we're seeing something contradictory. But at the time, it was very nerve wracking because we really felt like those messages, the handful of us who were opposed to it, those messages had to get out um, I'll tell you, I never lost more sleep than those early days of um, digging through what actual data existed, and that was flu data, and hospitalization. Because outside of a few cities, as you know, the hospitals weren't overblown with COVID cases. Um, so anyway, it was a very scary, dark time. And unfortunately, will there be a COVID reckoning I think the big chance to do it was 2022. And look, fans, every governor who shut down their state from Gretchen Whitmer, a Democrat, Phil Murphy in New Jersey, um, Mike DeWine in Ohio, who had very harsh lockdowns for a Republican, every single one of them got reelected and some by big margins. That was the chance to get rid of the people responsible for what happened during COVID. And it didn't happen. One of my big lessons from COVID, you talked about the scientific community really kind of failing us, right? They, they got in lockstep with the media, so did the doctors, is the danger of professional organizations and professional accreditations. Because mm -hmm. these people are given the right to work because their professional certification says, okay, you're allowed to be a medical doctor. Or you're a part of this you know, group mm -hmm. of scientists. And what they, those groups did was they said, hey, anybody that talks outside of this accreditation, we're going to ruin you. And we didn't know how this would all play out. Like all those soldiers that were bumped out of the military because they didn't want to get vaccines, all of the scientists that would say like, hey, I'd like to tell you more about things like ivermectin or what I know about masks, but I'm, I will lose my license the way that I feed my family. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that professional organizations should be something we take a cold, hard look at because we don't want centrally controlled one way to look at problems, one way to fix them. And that's what those organizations are doing. I think that's such a good point. And that is something that I think um, at least Congress or state legislatures can look at where this grant funding went what their support is of these professional organizations, whether it's tax exemption or whatever. But when you have medical, powerful medical groups, I think it was the uh, obstetrician group that came out and recommended that pregnant women get an untested vaccine. And they pushed that. And now we see what happened. I mean, that to me was the height of irresponsibility, recklessness. And then I think it was the Pediatrics Association that came out and said, children, two years old and older should be getting these experimental vaccines. How in the world can they possibly look at themselves in the mirror not knowing, and now you see these health, um, you know, health 
problems that people are having, especially young people. You had girls, I know just anecdotally, my, neither one of my daughters got the vaccine, even though they, one was high school, one was college. We did everything we could to get those exemptions and fought really hard. But her friends right away in college were already complaining about their changes in their menstrual cycles immediately, right after the vaccine. Who knows what that's going to mean for these girls as they get older and want to plan a family? And the medical community, have they done any other follow-up to that? Okay, we forced vaccines on our young girls. We saw immediately complaints about their physical condition, their changes in their menstrual cycles. Are we now looking back three years later to see what's happening with those young girls? Are there any tests being done? The scientific community, are they stepping up to make sure that the recommendations that they made are not having detrimental, you know, irreversible health consequences on young people? To your point, it's been completely memory hold. Don't even talk about it. There's no information out there. I mean, can you imagine somebody applying for uh, an NHS grant or, you know, a grant from a government agency to be able to Mm -hmm. run these kinds of tests? There's just there's no chance that those things would happen. And if somebody out there knows like, no, no, Vance, you're wrong. Uh, Look at all these studies that are getting Mm -hmm. funded. I'd happily see them. But I I strongly sense that um, just like we still don't have I mean, you would think that the Wuhan lab would be under unimaginable scrutiny, absolutely unending every single moment of every single day, people pounding on the door to say what exactly happened, who did it, who knew about it, and it's it's just not happening. And it's because, I don't know. I mean, like, the easy answer is that we're living in clown world. And I oftentimes wonder, is it that the people are totally incompetent or is it that they are driven um, by some sort of a narrative uh, and some higher like 3D chess game that I just I just can't possibly understand? Well, I think in 2020, one of it, you know, anyone who suggested that this was manufactured in the lab was called a conspiracy theorist. Now, everyone who was called a conspiracy theorist early on ends up being actually the person who exposes the truth. And so when Rand Paul or someone brought that up in 2020, or at least wanted to investigate it, he was just vilified by the media and everyone else, Democrats and Republicans, calling him a conspiracy theorist. I think that they took down even something he wrote at the Washington Post or New York Times about it. But in 2020, recall, it was really important, especially in these swing states, to make sure that the pandemic panic continued through the election because that is what enabled all of these long-term Democratic Party um, preferences of how to vote. You know, same-day voting, um, absentee, the ballot harvesting, things that Democrats have wanted for a long time. And so this, the extension of the panic, really enabled these extremely lax voting rules uh, the Democrats have wanted for a long time and obviously benefited Democrats. So, and you had key swings because states several of them, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, who were had Republican or excuse me, Democratic governors who instituted a lot of this. So you can't really separate the COVID panic, especially towards the latter part of 2020, um, with its ties to the election. But Vance, what do we do now? You've got to, you know, DOJ is not going to investigate any of this. So who is? Um, you know, if Donald Trump, you know, not to be political, but if he wins the presidency, what's he going to do? Investigate himself for what happened early on? Yeah. I, just, and uh, I you know, I was uh, I spent the weekend um, with a little bit of the little bit of time I have with two young girls um, looking at some videos of the way that um, the mainstream media portrays January 6th, because. Really, and mm-hmm. I, like I know I'm talking to somebody that has spent a lot of time and energy on this. I kind of saw it yeah. from afar when it was happening. A few days later, my dad and I talked on the phone and he was like, did you see what happened? And I was kind of like, I don't know. It, it seems like it's kind of a bigger deal than it is. But then I watched these videos mm-hmm. and they're of huge throngs of people beating police with batons and people spraying stuff and banging on the doors give me a rundown now that you've spent so much time and maybe give a little bit of background on how much time you have put on this. What, what happened on January 6th and how is it that there is so much footage that makes those people look like they really were 
banging on the doors and about ready to take down the Capitol. So I always say January 6th, a lot of different things were happening at different vantage points at different times on January 6th. Um, But I would say overall, the government and the people who were in charge are ultimately responsible for what happened. And in terms of what I've how much time I spent, Vance, I have no idea. I mean, I was watching it on that day. I thought the overreaction was absurd. Um, I was very suspicious that all of a sudden everyone from Joe Biden to lawmakers to the media to George W. Bush were issuing statements calling it an insurrection. I thought that was crazy, especially in light of all the violence we had seen throughout 2020, the second, especially in Washington, D.C. So I immediately thought it was so overblown such an overreaction. And it just didn't add up. That's just not how Trump supporters who had had all of these rallies, including November and December in Washington, they were the ones being attacked by BLM and Antifa rioters in the streets. I mean, young families being assaulted by these by these protesters or rioters, whatever you want to call them. So it just didn't add up to me. But I think right away, when you're tipping off, like we just talked about COVID lockdowns, The first lie that was told was that a Capitol Police officer had been murdered by Trump supporters, bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. This is the Brian Sicknick story. That is what the New York Times wrote on January 8th, 2021. And right away I'm thinking, and this went viral, you know, then everything changed to the alleged murder of Brian Sicknick. No one was talking about the four Trump supporters who died that day, including Ashley Babbitt, who was shot at near point blank range by a Capitol Police officer. This very successfully within 48 hours shifted the whole focus of the story to Trump supporters bludgeoned to death a Capitol Police officer. Well, I'm thinking, I'm already watching, I was already immersed in it. There's video everywhere. If a Capitol Police officer was being beaten to death with a fire extinguisher, we would have seen it. This is the most photographed, recorded event in American history. The Department of Justice says this in their court filings. There's no video of this. So then they kept overblowing it, and then they laid Brian Sicknick in state, a very rare honor. Um, You know, Joe Biden and Jill Biden went to the ceremony. He's eulogized by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And everyone's going, wait, we still don't have any video photographs of this happening. None. The autopsy wasn't being released. His brother had sent out a text that said he had been pepper sprayed, but he was fine. So then what happens? After all the optics, after the impeachment vote for Trump comes out, oh no, he he wasn't bludgeoned to death by a fire extinguisher. Completely made up, Vance. A completely made up story. Did anyone at the New York Times get fired for that? No. Did any editor get fired? No. Nothing. Did Dean back at the publisher, did he apologize? No. No one said a word. Just corrected the story. Then the next thing was, oh, he had a, he he died of allergic reaction to pepper spray. So this is what I started following early on in 2021 was the Brian Sicknick story. Again, just all the changes to the story, the same media outlets, New York Times, MSNBC, everyone in on this. Then they changed it to he died of an allergic reaction to bear spray. That ends up not being true. The D.C. coroner, obviously another partisan figure because everyone in D.C. is finally releases a report in April, a delayed report saying that he died of two blood clots uh, or two strokes from a blood clot near his brain. Had nothing to do with fire extinguisher, had nothing to do with being sprayed with pepper spray. Then we found out later what happened, actually how he was sprayed. So I think that's what really alerted me that, no, there's something more. And then I will tell you the big thing to me, someone sent me video in May of 2021 of police assaulting protesters outside on that Western side that afternoon. And that is what prompted all the confrontations, most of them between protesters and police, was excessive force by Capitol Police and DC Metro Police against protesters that prompted a lot of the violent clashes that we saw that afternoon. When you talk with somebody that like, uh, that's only watching what's on the news, they like they're not bad people they're sitting there saying look i'm seeing the exact same thing that you julie kelly are seeing and i'm seeing things like these people were trying to break down the doors and they were you know in the capitol building and they shouldn't have been um 
What do you think about those people? Are they just fooled? Do they just have a different opinion than you? What What's your take on that? Well, I mean, I would argue with the fact that they are seeing the same thing that I'm seeing because they just haven't. I mean, if they're following, if they're watching CNN or MSNBC or even just the nightly local news stations in St. Louis or wherever, they're only seeing what the DOJ and Biden regime want them to see, which is why, Vance, the other thing is when the DOJ and Capitol Police wanted all of the thousands of hours of surveillance video captured inside the building and outside under a protective order, they did not want even defendants that they were arresting to see all of the surveillance video. Well, yeah, why? explain this. This I mean, is we're wild, right? The same clip. This is this is that there was all this right. surveillance video, and it came it became under lock and key, and and you couldn't. They didn't just That's release right. it out. You got to see that footage, didn't you? I did. I've gotten to see a lot of it, um, but from March of 2021. All of the 14,000 hours that we were told at the time from an affidavit that was filed by the general counsel for Capitol Police said all of this video was sensitive government material. It needed to remain under protective order. Vance, even clips as small as 45 seconds, 60 seconds were under protective orders if they were being used in these January 6 cases. And in many instances, believe it or not, a group called the Press Coalition filed lawsuits in court trying to get access even to these very short clips that the government for some reason didn't want to put on the public docket. Well, then finally they successfully got a surveillance video in one of the cases of the Proud Boys that very clearly show police, several officers standing by on the upper west side of the building, allowing at least 300 protesters to walk through. So as some of that footage Came, became available, it really did contradict what the January 6th Select Committee was trying to do at the same time in DOJ and all the corporate media, which is to your point, all these protesters showed up, thousands of them incited by Donald Trump, beating up cops, you know, beating down doors. That certainly did happen. There were windows broken that allowed access for individuals to get in. Um, but by the same token, you also saw Doors were open. The police were not telling people not to come in. We saw then, now we've seen the inside of the building, and certainly some of your viewers have seen this, where Capitol Police are just standing there, letting people walk by, fist bumping them. You know, people are taking photos in, of themselves in the rotunda. And so, as I said, there were different things happening at different times. But <clears throat> the idea that, and initially, it, also, let's go back to the fact why did Nancy Pelosi, the people responsible for protecting the Capitol, Nancy Pelosi, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, the Capitol Police Board, why did they keep that area so unprotected? Why did they just have a couple flimsy bike racks? Who were the people that were tearing down the snow fencing? That was another surveillance video that I've posted. Some unidentified man. This all happened right at the time Donald Trump's speech ended at the ellipse, which is about a mile and a half away from the Capitol grounds. So then the timing just all started to not make sense. And the biggest thing is, why was this so unprotected? If then, as we found out later, there was intelligence that was being collected that said something could happen. So Nancy Pelosi, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, the Capitol Police Board, which is really responsible for the security, all denying pleas and offers for National Guardsmen to be there. Well, why? I, it, so why did they leave it that way? And then, of course, then we have Nancy Pelosi on video. Her daughter is following her around. She's a documentarian. You know, she's filming every movement that day. So, <clears throat> yes, big parts of what happened on January 6th were indeed orchestrated. FBI informants run into these alleged militia groups months before Stoking conversations, just like we saw in Whitmer, um, stoking conversations later used as evidence of these militiamen supposedly planning this violent armed insurrection. When uh, all of the, the dust is settled, I don't know actually if it has or not, there have been people that have gone <laughs> to prison over this and they're, they're locked away. You followed these trials quite closely. How many people were prosecuted and is it over yet? It's not over. Uh, the total caseload is now approaching 1,300 defendants. 
the FBI, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, still arresting people every week, if you can believe it or not. Um, most of the char these charges are bogus. You have the weaponization of a post Enron tampering with evidence statute that now has been weaponized by this DOJ. It is now before the Supreme Court, man. So this is the top felony that has been slapped against more than 300 defendants and Donald Trump. Uh, it has been mi intentionally misinterpreted by DOJ to turn these people into felons, allegedly obstructing an official proceeding. So how so and we have hundreds who have gone to jail for petty offenses such as parading in the Capitol, something that is never even handled by the federal courts in Washington. Usually, if you get in trouble for trespassing in any Capitol building, you're protesting, say, Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation or you're, you know, pro-Palestinian activist occupying house buildings, you get a slap on the wrist, you leave. If you walked into the Capitol at three o'clock on the afternoon of January 6th, not only could you be a potential felon, your life is destroyed, your family, your community, your neighbors abandon you, you lose your job, you're bankrupted. I mean, this is the fate of what's happened to these people because they have been called domestic terrorists by Everyone from Joe Biden to Chris Ray, Attorney General Merrick Garland, and certainly the national and local press. So hundreds already sentenced parading, the obstruction felony, um, assaulting police officers, seditious conspiracy. This is the charge that um, several members of the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers have been convicted on. So when people like Elise Stefanik or Donald Trump call them political prisoners or hostages, it is true. Because these charges have never been used in this way, seditious conspiracy, obstruction of an official proceeding, parading in the Capitol, just for a few that have never been applied this way. And then long, harsh prison sentences that are attached to those convictions or plea deals. And then DOJ coming and asking judges and getting it, domestic, or excuse me, terror enhancements for things like shaking a metal fence well, you attempted, you tried to destroy government property in pursuit of seditious conspiracy. So we're going to add time under terror enhancements. These are all things that were targeted, created during the first war on terror. These are sent to terror enhancements that were applied to the blind sheik and his crew, not a proud boy who shaked a temporary metal fence outside of the Capitol. Well, and anybody in that, property. that has been that, that has I, it's so funny because I think of all the riots and the and the burning and the, all the stuff that mm -hmm. happened around the time when Trump was elected and, and then afterwards at George Floyd and and um, mm -hmm. and anybody that's even watching that has to say, like, well, weren't they like throwing Molotov cocktails over fences at, at just federal mm -hmm. buildings in Portland? Like, were, didn't they like light entire mm -hmm. blocks on fire? You know, like why, why is this like, and mm -hmm. I think people like me and I probably just continue to have naivety about all of this are like, you can't be blind to this. This, this must be an intentional or, or willful way of, of, uh, choosing who you're going to, which disruptioner are you going to go after? Well, the biggest comparison I have is what happened in Lafayette Square in May and June of 2020. So the biggest comparison is you had rioters, BLM, George Floyd rioters at Lafayette Square, which is public property. You had them attacking federal police officers, which is charges that J6ers face, park police and Secret Service. You had them trying to scale the fence of the White House. If you'll recall, the White House was sent into lockdown Memorial Day weekend when these protests started. And to your point, assaulting police, trying to scale the fence there, they had to add more barbed wire and fencing around the White House. And this lasted for days. This didn't last for three hours on a Wednesday afternoon. This lasted four days. Hundreds of police officers who were injured hit with firecrackers, hit with motor scooters, hit with frozen water bottles. This was what Antifa and BLM were doing to police across the country, but certainly in Washington. What happened to those rioters fans? The same DC US attorney who is now, now threatening on January 6th, the three year anniversary, threatened to round up more people who were just standing on public property outside the Capitol on January 6th, promising to round up thousands of more. The same DC US attorney's office dropped all charges against the Lafayette Square rioters and helped settle a civil lawsuit 
that the rioters filed against police, against the two police departments, and the D.C. U.S. attorney blamed police for being too aggressive against those rioters. All charges dropped, far more dangerous, a legit insurrection because they were trying to scale the walls and get to the president of the United States, not enter a building that had been evacuated at 2.20 in the afternoon. So that is the double standard, I think. Whether you see those images on January 6th and you want people who assaulted police to be punished to the full extent, or you want people who smash windows or open doors, you want them punished. What really upsets people is seeing this double standard. We just got more news of BLM settlement. I think, I don't know if it was, maybe it was Seattle. You have all these major cities entering agreements to lawsuits and, and settling and giving these rioters money. But then you've got someone who walked into a public building peacefully, you know, high-fiving a police officer, and they're thrown in the slammer for for month, or months and years after their lives are already personally and professionally destroyed. So when they say that there is, these are political prisoners, they are, because they are being treated far differently than the protesters and things that we saw just months before January 6th. I talk about it all the time on, on the podcast about how um, <clears throat> afraid I am of mob action. And I think everybody got to see that mm -hmm. very clearly with, with what happened around BLM riots and and, you know, just when you get a group of people together and they feel like injustice is going on, you can't control them. They they will they will burst out. I uh, I now think about what's going on at the border of Texas and how the governor, after three years of complaining to the Biden administration, saying he, he wanted them to do something about it, finally said, no, nope, we're going to we're going to take care of this on our own. Now we're seeing the country split up. And you start to have people say, um, I am with the Texas government or no, I'm with the federal government. I know this is not something you are focused on. You're, you're um, on other issues. But as you look at this, where do you think this is heading? I mean, it could really escalate um, to a point where I think some Americans have suspected all along that this was going to go, that you have such a complete dearth of trust in every government institution. We've been lied to and misled so much as we've just talked about just in the past few years. And now you have an administration that is intentionally putting this country at deep risk and preventing governors and mayors from protecting their own citizens and stopping this influx of people who we don't know. And of course, as you know, this is spilling over. This isn't just Republicans. You have Democratic mayors in major cities saying, we, we can't handle this. Oh, we're a sanctuary city. Hate has no home here. Coexist, whatever. Then all of a sudden, <clears throat> you have these busloads of people coming in, overrunning all of their public services, putting their own residents at risk. Um, and so this is not just a partisan Republican issue. Um, but to have this administration, to have um, Secretary Mayorkas, to have the press secretary continually bald face lie to the American people that the border is secure and that this poses no national security threat. Um, you know, the, the American people see what's happening before their very eyes. And, you know, I think naturally, instinctively, we want to help people who are fleeing um, poverty and oppression. But when you see the makeup of the individuals coming in, these are not families. These are not mostly young children, and that doesn't even address the child trafficking and drug trafficking real crisis that's happening there. But these are young men, and we already know that there are people who are on the terror watch list who have been allowed into this country. So states have a right to defend themselves. Um, the Supreme Court, for now, this was a temporary uh, vacating of, of an injunction. Not really sure where that's going to completely end up. But the idea that states have to abide by what the Democrats and Joe Biden want, which is this influx of immigrants who they hope to eventually turn into Democratic Party voters, um, you know, this this really could get to uh, 
a dangerous level. Of course, I hope that's not the case, but if it is... Is that what your sense is? So is, so I guess two questions here, right? <clears throat> the If you go watch... you know, I try as best I can to go and watch news that I don't really agree with because I am I just want to know what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what right? they're saying is this is a PR stunt done by a Texas governor to be able to draw attention to his own state that's not going to really matter that much in the primaries right now. And that this is giving him a better chance to gain favor with Donald Trump if he can help win the election, but that this is really just a big PR stunt. And so that's my first question. And then my second question is, if the the uh, if it is actually happening, it's not just a PR stunt. Why is anyone funding this? What is the draw for them in the most charitable explanation that you have? Why do you think? that someone would be trying to bring in upwards of 6 million people uh, into the United States illegally? Um, so the first part, is this a publicity stunt? It could be. I mean, look, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, has been under fire from the right, and specifically people like Tucker Carlson, who have asked him, why haven't you taken more action? You have a job, you have a responsibility. Why haven't you done more? So this could just be a reaction kind of a late reaction from Governor Abbott, um, who also was sort of a pro-lockdown governor too. I mean, he's not exactly what you would call, <laughs> most people would sort of consider him what they call rhino, Republican. Yeah, the secessionist so, people in Texas think, don't don't think of him as on their team by any stretch of the imagination. They said it, he had three <laughs> years to do this and he's just doing right. it now. Exactly. So I think that that is sort of, why is he doing it now? Um, I think the situation has gotten so desperate that he was sort of coerced or pushed into doing it. So, And it's great to see these other 25 Republican governors immediately support what he's doing. So the test will be, to your point, is this a publicity stunt? If things really do escal escalate, if the Biden administration does, I guess, maybe nationalize the National Guard there or send troops or tries some other legal maneuver what the counter response will be. So I think it's hard to predict. We'll just kind of see what happens from there. Um, <clears throat> but why do they want this influx of immigrants? No one really can explain why, except that this is something that Democrats have wanted for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> just getting over something. That they've wanted for a long time, which is to fundamentally change the population of the United States and turn it into a less white country. And this is not something they've hidden. <clears throat> and this isn't a replacement theory, conspiracy theory. These are things that they've wanted for a long time. And so have a lot of Republicans, by the way. Um, you know, Republican inaction on illegal immigration, especially for the past few years, is very frustrating to the base, why they haven't done more. This week, they're supposed to finally proceed with articles of impeachment. Again, Secretary, Secretary Mayorkas, well, why wasn't that one of the first things you did when you took over, over a year ago? Where are the budget cuts or where is the support for these states to help them? So there's widespread frustration towards both parties and leaders of both parties. Um, and, and again, I don't think it's just Republicans who are concerned about this influx of illegal um, immigrants. It's Democrat voters, too. And this is why they're very concerned how this will impact the 2024 election, not just president, but up and down the ticket. If something dramatic doesn't happen to cut off this stream um, and the unknown people, the drugs, the child trafficking, human trafficking, et cetera, all the things that we know that are happening because of this open border. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens if uh, if the the cartels or whoever is escorting people over if they move from the Texas border over to Arizona or California and um, you start to see those states have to deal with their population saying, what are we going to do with 40,000 more um, illegal um, immigrants here in Phoenix or what are we going to do with them in San Diego? And they start having their own cities go. I, uh, I was listening to a guy talking about how all it could play out. And, um, you know, me, I'm kind of a I kind of like to push back on things. I like changing it up and seeing what new happens mm -hmm. like I'm comfortable with that. But he said something that really kind of um, 
made me say like, this is not the area to mess around in, right? We, we want to take very, very careful steps. And he said, because if for some reason this battle on the border were to take a, a turn, there was some sort of a shots fired by a national guard or by a state yeah. guard. Now, all of a sudden, the um, language that the, that, the, that the Democrats have been using, you mentioned it before, insurrectionists, secessionists, um, you know, that they're in a civil yeah. war, all of a sudden gives them the ability to say, oh, we're in a civil war, which means we now can suspend the Constitution like Abraham Lincoln did. And now all these rights that have kept us from being able to move faster on our agenda is possible. I think this is like worst case scenario. But it, you now can see a path to that happening, whereas a few months ago, the path was not clear for how that might happen. And look, we know that we've seen this, that the Biden regime and Democrats, they they thrive on crisis and chaos. It's not the Republican Party. It's Democrats who create these crises and especially intended to influence elections. And so... Yeah, this could get to uh, this could escalate. Um, and to your point, what happens if there are shots fired? You know, what happens if there are National Guardsmen or Border Patrol or just individuals who are showing up there to help secure that border? Um, what happens then? And would you put I've I've covered this this regime and the DOJ, especially in these agencies. Would they stop at anything to get what they want and stay in power? No. They, they respect no boundaries. They certainly don't respect the Constitution. They are completely reckless and lawless they, because they're not accountable to anyone. They always get away with whatever they want to. And so would they say, or would, or would the media say, okay, this is a step too far. You can't start you know, attacking or doing whatever to your own citizens. No, they wouldn't. There's just no stopgap. And that, I think that's the scariest aspect. of So that. I, uh, we're going to wrap up soon, but I want to hear Julie Kelly's crystal ball on, on a couple of different things. The first one is, um, uh -oh. what do you think is going to happen with the presidential election in January of 2025? Who will be being sworn in as the U S president? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't. I don't know. Obviously Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. We're still waiting, you know, with these cases, both of his federal trials right now are on hold um, as they kind of flush out some immunity issues. There's some legal things that need to be settled before he can go to trial. He was supposed to start trial in Washington, keep in mind, on March 4th. Would they put him on trial in September and October in Washington? Absolutely. Merrick Garland just said that. Basically, it's out of his hands. It's in the hands of the court. So if this immunity issue is finally settled, whether a president can be criminally prosecuted and the Supreme Court comes back and says, yeah, you can, will they put him on trial in the most democratic city uh, in the country as early voting is going on? Absolutely. So could that impact it? Yes. Um, I, I honestly don't know. You know, Donald Trump obviously is still very popular. A lot of people still believe the 2020 election was illegitimate. Um, and so they, they want him. And a lot of people just want him back as president because of the country was better off, the economy, national security, all these crises that we see didn't happen under him. So that's why he still maintains such popularity uh, in the Republican Party. Joe Biden right now is extremely unpopular. I think he, he's at um, historic lows for approval of his presidency. But will that unpopularity and anger about what's happening translate into needed votes for Donald Trump? I don't know. You know that people who hate Donald Trump uh, want him behind bars. They're not going to change their mind because, you know, inflation is high or, you know, they're, they're, they're not. So there's such an entrenched opposition on both sides. It'll just basically be, I think, go back to these swing states, how the voting proceeds, um, you know, lawsuits that are filed before and after. Because in these swing states, there's going to try to get away with what they did in 2020, which is violate state law in many cases, especially Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, and Michigan, um, to make sure that there are enough votes for Joe Biden. So I think people are understandably very nervous about that, too. Look, this is going to be a tough year. Everyone was expecting it. Um, and I think it's playing out that way, especially with the crisis at the border, now facing Donald Trump going to trial. 
Um, and, you know, who knows what else will pop up. Well, then my last... So I don't have a prediction. So, I'm sorry. So this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an even harder question after you couldn't answer the first one. Um, but I, I, you know, gave a great analysis. But um, five years out, what do you think is going to be going on in your life? Not necessarily around the world, but what, what do you think... Um, what do you think will be important to you in five years? Wow. I don't know. Um, hopefully have, you know, a son-in-law or two, maybe a <laughs> couple of grandchildren. I don't know. It's hard to even say that out loud, but five years, you know, a lot can happen. Um, <clears throat> so personally, you know, just obviously hoping for the best for my family and myself. Um, but as far as the country, Really hoping that in five years we're really starting to roll back, um, you know, the destruction, destructive elements in our government that really want to fundamentally, radically change what this country is, what our people are about, our laws, our traditions, everything else. So I'm really hoping five years from now we kind of look back and say, you know, those of us who were fighting and wanting the truth and defending those who needed it that we had the outcomes that we were hoping for. Um, whether that happens, again, I don't, I don't have an answer um, because I know these powerful interests, you know, I've seen them in court. I see what these prosecutors and judges, this government is capable of doing. Um, their lack of humanity, as we talked about with lockdowns, um, in some ways they're sadistic uh, impulses where they enjoy people suffering um, that's, I think, my biggest uh, angst of following January 6th. But let's hope that all of this at the end of the day is a successful exercise in salvaging our country and rooting out these really bad people who have wanted to destroy it for a very long time. Well, that was a fantastic answer. Julie, if people wanted to read more <laughs> of your stuff, um, follow what you're doing, where, where should they go? Well, Vance, it's so good to talk with you. As you said, we've been friends a long time. We go way back. I'm so proud of your success. And now you're a dad. And, you know, it's so great to see everything that's happened to you. You so deserve it. So um, so my work can be found at Substack, Declassified with Julie Kelly. I also write for Real Clear Investigations. So I've got some pieces up there, including the Whitmer piece. Um, I'm on Twitter, X a lot, Julie underscore Kelly, too. I have my own podcast, Happy Hour with Liz. So, um, but... Those are the main places where you could find my work and my reporting. Well, I am so glad I get to hear you on Mark Reardon's show every now and then talking about what's going on. And right. uh, I have just watched you go from being a woman that was wondering why people were against GMOs to now putting out information <laughs> that I think actually puts you in, in actual real danger. And I'm grateful that there are people that stand up for their convictions in that way. So thank you so much, Julie, for coming on. Thanks, fans. Great to see you. Ah, ah, ah.